Here's the top 10 income list I shared in November 2023. I've trimmed back half of these and added some new positions. So we are a long overdue an update. Today, I'll go through the major changes and why I made them. Hi from Vietnam, still here, still loving it. Let's dive straight into the list. SPYI is currently yielding just under 12%. This one is an easy choice. It offers diversification of the S&P 500. It sells covered call options out of the money to allow for some appreciation and it's tax efficient. Selling calls means giving up some potential upside in exchange for cash today. The strategy is covered in this video. All things being equal, I'd pick the fund in this category with the longest track record, but things are not equal. Look at FBYI's total return since inception versus its major competitors, Jeppy and XYLD. SPYI is only 584 days old, but so far it's leading the way with the highest yield and, these things usually don't go together, the highest total return. During a market correction, Jeppy will probably outperform SPYI because it's more value focused. That's what happened here. But the market goes up more than it goes down, so I've shifted most of my Jeppy to SPYI. By the way, if you're new to the channel, I retired in 2017, and that's when I got serious about researching my investments in far greater depth, because now they pay for everything, including yet more of these yummy spring rolls. And no, I'm not addicted to them. I quit any time. Uh, actually, we'll just move those away for now. All right. I mostly focus on stocks and funds paying consistent yields of just over 8%. Today's list averages 10.2% to be precise. JEPQ is currently yielding 9%. Let's say 9-ish because it varies every month based on the volatility of the NASDAQ. This is another covered call fund that's based on an index. This time it's the NASDAQ 100. Whereas NEOS manages their own option trades for SBYI, the fund manager for JEPI, JP Morgan, outsources that work to banks. They use a financial instrument called an equity linked note, or ELN. It's all explained in the JEPQ review. JEPQ's biggest competitor in terms of size was QYLD, which has been around for more than 10 years. Then in December of 2023, there was a party, I presume, at the JEPQ office because this happened. JEPQ overtook QYLD for assets under management. Why? Well, I'd say because of performance. JEPQ's total return since inception, 703 days ago as I record this, is double that of QYLD. Before we move on to number three, let me explain why I made this top 10 list. I use diversification to reduce risk, so I hold over 30 stocks and funds, but I understand that some investors don't want to hold that many, or they're just getting started, and this is all a bit overwhelming. So if I had to narrow it down to just 10, these are the ones I'd pick based on a blend of high yield, total return, consistent income, and diversification. For example, I hold Starwood and it pays a higher yield than RQI, but Starwood isn't on this list because RQI offers far more diversification and a better total return over the long term, but we'll get to RQI in a minute. Those first two funds are a bit predictable. They're all over YouTube. Unless you watch this channel, I don't think you'll be familiar though with the next fund because it doesn't have billions of dollars under management, actually less than 100 million although it has doubled in size since the November video. So shout out to the portfolio manager, Michael Petro. PBDC is yielding 9.5% and I bought it because I like the business development sector. BDCs are private lenders focused on small and medium sized business loans. They have more flexibility than banks. For example, they could take an equity position in the company that they lend to and banks can't do that. The thing is there are about 50 BDCs, and they're not all good. Putnam's BDC fund currently invests in 18 of them, and I think they're good at picking the right ones. Here are the top 10 that currently make up 80% of the fund. I've reviewed four of those on this channel. By the way, you may see some crazy high fees like these over 6%. Just ignore that. It's an SEC rule that applies to BDC funds and counts internal expenses from the holdings as fees. I'll include a link to a full explanation in the description. The actual management fee for PBDC is 0.75%. 
a bit on the high side, but not unusual for a small specialized fund like this. They only have $72 million under management as I record this, and that's just $540,000 in fees. And remember, as we learned in that interview with Garrett from Neos, a large chunk of those fees go to accountants, insurance companies, lawyers, and other vendors. Next up are two credit funds that are new additions to the top 10. ARDC is yielding a whisker under 10%, and they invest in corporate loans and bonds. The key word here is invest. The BDCs I mentioned a moment ago originate loans to businesses, which means they review the financials and decide if they want to lend the money. When these credit funds buy a loan, somebody else, like say a bank, already originated the loan. The credit fund is simply an investor. So they're similar to BDCs in that you're investing in credit rather than equities, but they're not the same thing. The other credit fund I bought recently is AFT. It's currently yielding 11.5%. Why the two different credit funds? Well, AFT is weighted towards floating loans, which are benefiting from today's high interest rates. And ARDC is a blend of floating rate loans, bonds, and collateralized loan obligations. I don't expect to hold these funds forever as they only do well under certain situations. For example, they tend to underperform when interest rates are really low. I added them to my portfolio for diversification. I didn't want to be 100% in equities. A quick time-sensitive note, though, about AFT. It is the subject of a proposed merger with MFIC. As I record this, the merger is subject to a vote. There's debate about the positive or negative effects of the yes or no vote on AFT. If you don't want to study the merger, just wait until around mid-2024, by which time all of this will have been decided one way or the other. I mentioned RQI last month in this video because it's an easy way to gain exposure to almost 200 REITs. It's currently yielding just over 8%. More recently, I started buying it because I expected to benefit from interest rate cuts, even though we have no clue when those cuts will actually happen. Interest is a significant expense for REITs and lower rates will improve their profit margins and allow them to expand their real estate portfolios at a lower cost. PFFA is yielding just over 9.5% and it gives exposure to almost 200 preferred stocks. Regular stocks can pay whatever dividend the board approves, but preferred stocks set their payout in advance. For example, 6% of $25 and that defined consistent income stream can be a good fit for retirees. This is another asset category that will benefit from lower interest rates, partly because preferred stock prices tend to behave in a similar way to bonds, and partly because the fund uses 20 to 30% leverage, which will become cheaper when interest rates drop. I always get questions about fees for funds like this because they're a bit confusing. The total expense ratio of 2.52% looks high because leveraged funds like this have to show interest as an expense. The actual management fee is 0.80%. ARCC is a business development company that currently yields over 9%. And so far, I've been emphasizing diversification, picking funds that spread the risk over hundreds of investments. These last three investments, though, are exceptions to that strategy. ARCC is just one company, and like any company, it could falter. So why did I include it? Well, first of all, it's not just any BDC. It's the largest BDC by a long way, as you can see from this Raymond James ranking. And by the way, if you want an overview of the BDC universe, this Raymond James report is one of the best I've found. I'll include a link to it in the description. Second reason, ARCC has a consistent payout history going back almost 20 years. And last of all, ARCC is trading at 1.07 times NAV, which is less expensive than BDCs like Maine and Capital Southwest, both of which are trading at significant premiums at the moment. Another individual investment is HESM. It's a midstream limited partnership currently yielding just over 7%, a bit lower than the others, but it has a history of consistently raising distributions. HES midstream gets paid some juicy fees to store, treat, and transport oil and gas. Not as exciting as oil exploration, but it is consistent. I'd like to diversify into a fund that holds lots of these midstream partnerships, but I can't find one that outperforms HESM. 
Most of the individual midstream partnerships issue K-1 forms in March, which delays tax filing. A lot of people don't like that. HESM, though, is an exception. It does not issue a K-1. Rounding out the list of 10 is SVOL. It's currently yielding over 16%. This is one of my favorite investments, but I left it out of the November 2023 list because of risk. This fund shorts the volatility of the S&P 500 index, aka the VIX. If the VIX spikes really high, like it did during the pandemic, this fund would suffer a massive loss. It mitigates that risk with call options, but they haven't been tested in the real world. I don't recommend buying this or any fund for that matter, unless you understand the risk and you're comfortable with it. And this one is a bit complicated to understand. With that long disclaimer out of the way, I've decided to include SVOL in this top 10 list because more time has passed and it continues to deliver really impressive results. The distribution history is consistent and the total return since inception in 2021 is better than good. It's still a nose ahead of the S&P 500 despite the fact that it doesn't hold any tech stocks. Most of the charts I used today came from Seeking Alpha and Snowball. Distribution history charts are available on both of those platforms, but I use Snowball to keep track of the income from several brokerages. If you're looking for a way to organize your dividends, this video here compares my two favorite dividend trackers, and there's a link in the description for a discount on Snowball. Here are some that I left out and why, and we'll just blow through these really quickly. I've reviewed QQQI and Fepi, and they look good so far, but they are new. JEPQ's longer history counts for a lot. Over time, I do plan to continue building positions in both as they prove themselves. Main, CSWC, or Capital Southwest, and BXSL were in my November update, and their greatest crime was excellent performance. I still own them, but I did trim them back for two reasons. Firstly, their prices shot up considerably, so they took up too much room in my portfolio, which is always a nice problem. Secondly, I prefer a good active BDC fund over my ability to select and fade individual BDCs, and PBDC is fulfilling that purpose. I still hold BST, but I've trimmed it back because I prefer the higher yields offered by JEPQ, FEPI, and QQQI, all of which focus on the tech-heavy NASDAQ 100. What should you do with this list? Well, please don't just blindly copy it. I've been hesitant to share lists like this because I don't want you to think I'm telling you what to buy. These investments work for me, but not for everybody. You can get more growth from growth stocks or safer dividends from dividend aristocrats. But if, like me, you want a consistent high income stream, then perhaps a list like this could help you find some new ideas that work for your portfolio. I'll cover other investments from my portfolio in future videos, but if you want to learn more about any of the stocks and funds I mentioned today, there are plenty of detailed articles on Seeking Alpha about all of them. I'll put a link in the description for a discount and a free trial to Seeking Alpha. Or you can click on the reviews I put into this top 10 playlist that explains how each of those stocks and funds generates income and the pros and cons of each one. That wraps it up for this top 10 update. More armchair income coming soon. Oh, look, they brought more shrimp and pork rolls. How did those get there?